Hello, this is Kurt Gomez in Houston, Texas, and I'd like to welcome you all to your Break It Down show with the guy that we've all come to know and love and my lifelong friend, Pete A. Turner. You know, it's amazing to think that the show is approaching a thousand episodes. Over the last few years, the show has shown amazing growth, is absolutely contagious, and it can be found everywhere as podcasts, Facebook and YouTube videos, t shirts. You can't miss it. It has upgraded equipment multiple cameras, and hey man, Pete's catchy intros, oh so good. And the guests, out of control crazy. High quality, thoughtful intelligence always makes me say, hmm, I never thought about that or even knew about that. So I can't wait to see what the future holds, and I'm super excited that I'll be with it the entire way. Also, remember to head to savethebrave.org and participate in supporting their mission as well as mine by clicking the donate tab and reaching out to a vet. That one little interaction can save a life. So I implore all of you to please do what you can to support the organization, the charity, and our veterans. Yeah, okay. So speaking of guests, and let's let's get right into it, shall we? Today I'm privileged to be introducing Navy SEAL Clint Emerson, an Army combat spy, and guess who? Pete Turner, who today will be bringing their perspectives of current events and past experiences to share with us all. Clint is a retired Navy SEAL of more than 20 years of service. He continues to serve by empowering good people with safety and security skills at home, at work, and abroad. His services have helped Fortune 500 companies, politicians, celebrities, and more, and hopefully all of us today. Pete uh, is a former U.S. Army intelligence and combat spy who spent many years talking to and interacting with the residents of war-torn regions such as Bosnia and Iraq with the goal of feeding critical information back to Army Command, all the while evading danger at every turn. So Pete, Clint, looking forward to the conversation and turning it over to you. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Cruz. This is Bryce Vine. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan This is Sebastian Younger. This is Daryl Ames. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> hey, how's it going? I'm Clint Emerson, retired Navy SEAL, author of 100 Daily Skills and some other things. And I'm Pete A. Turner, guest on You're Watching The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Thanks, Shelly, for doing the hosting for us. Hey, my pleasure. Thanks for turning over the mic to me today, Pete. Thanks for being here, Clint. I know yep. you were here recently and... Um, I asked both of these gentlemen to come back and let me turn the tables on them because I think they have some really interesting information for us, the viewers, from maybe a different perspective. So, Pete, uh, again, thanks for the mic. And I know that you are approaching your thousandth episode. Is that correct? That's right. A thousand's coming up soon. Yeah. So, congratulations. And before we get started, I just want to do like a little bit of role reversal here. You've sat in this seat for all those episodes. Can you share a story maybe that's happened along the way that uh, maybe one of your unexpected behind the scenes that nobody knew was going on, but you were kind of dancing in the background? Or do you have any stories where somebody said something that was unexpected or happened? Got any fun behind the scenes stories for us? You know, the behind the scenes things are interesting because the uh, we were just doing it ourselves. We were having this great off mic moment where we're talking about writing books and how that business works and exchanging ideas and supporting one another. And so it doesn't matter what industry I'm talking to. You know, um, we just had J.R. Robinson on, the most recorded drummer ever. He, any song, if you listen to the radio for five minutes, you've literally heard at least one, if not two, of his songs. So you, you get him off mic, and you're, he's just a regular dude, and we're trying to figure out how to help one another. Here I am helping a guy that gets called by Quincy Jones to drum. You know, yeah. like hey, so. It's uh, those are the things that are really incredible is you just you get these powerful uh, friendships started and, and collaborations. And sometimes they pan out, sometimes they don't. But everybody's just in a creative space. And I had no idea. Of, I mean, you know, good things are going to happen. But when these collaborations, you know, germ up and you look and you're like, wow, look at these things are growing. You know, it's just uh, it's really neat to be in a positive space where we do that because there's a whole lot of negative spaces out there. Mm, yeah, we, we've seen that recently. What about have you ever been caught with a hot mic? Didn't know you're on or didn't know you're live. And yeah, I don't you know, think there's... you could say anything inappropriate on this show because I've listened to the show. Yeah. So pretty much <laughs> yeah. it's an open, but 
there's a new thing that all of these different sites do is they autoplay video and I'm desperate to try to have it not bleed into the show. And every now and then you'll hear that. That's the biggest mm. pain in the butt thing is like, I, I'm trying to cue these things up and bring them into the show. And I don't want the video to play. I just want a link yeah. literally like I just want the link to pop in and, uh, and the stupid video comes through and it's exasperating because you just can't shut it up fast Got enough. It. You can push pl stop. You can push mute, and it's like never mind all that. I'm gonna play loud right now, and you're like, yeah. So that's sort of a hot mic moment. Got it, got it, Clint. I know you do a lot of video. Um, you've gone across the country, kind of meeting and and filming with the best of the best in their area. Um, do you have any funny stories where maybe you got your lights knocked out or you had an an accident filming. If any if you have not watched Clint's stuff, you've got to because it's really cool. Clint, tell us a little bit about what that series was and then did you have any behind the scenes moments where you got knocked out literally? Um yeah, so 100 Daily Skills Combat Edition is a book that's coming out here in the next couple of weeks, but uh we did a show um, I, I had initially filmed everything on the road of what we were doing, ended up being seven terabytes of footage. And, um, and then we we're like, well, why don't we just turn this into a series and see if someone will buy it? And so we ended up doing a deal with the Warrior Poet Society Network, which is a, a private streaming network run by a former uh, ranger. And uh, he's got his own shows, got his own world on there. It's kind of cool. So if you haven't checked out Warrior Poet Society, you should. Um, but anyway, yeah, I mean, while we're on the road, uh, I mean, probably the craziest thing that happened is when this was last May in mid May, we were cutting across, um, where were we? We were cutting across like North, let's say North Dakota, somewhere in there it was the middle of the night. We're driving from one badass to another badass. And it was pouring rain. And I remember looking out my, my front windshield off to the right. And when the lightning hit, I could see this huge funnel cloud. Oh. And so this tornado touched down just off the highway. <laughs> and we were like, whoa. And I've got just this one Netflix camera guy sitting in the back. And he's uh, significantly younger than me. Um, but we bo he, he basically plasters his face to the side of the window looking, trying to track it. And then we found ourselves literally taking exits and running away from it with some other vehicles because it was coming our way. We were just trying to get distance between this thing. And uh, anyway, we all ended up going. There was a there was a Motel 6 and it was, believe it or not, during that moment in the pandemic, Motel 6 was the only ho hotels that were open. So. Did and they leave the light on? Isn't that, they, is that they, the one that leaves the light they, on for you? They certainly had the light on and we all the vehicles went into there and we ran into the lobby and we all got rooms and just hunkered down there for the night. But it was, uh, yeah, that was probably the, probably the little more of the pucker factor during that <laughs> days. I love it. Well, we're going to kind of move into the meat of the, of the interview here. Um, and just, I mean, we have, kind of have to reflect on what's just happened recently. And throughout this, this interview, I'd really like to pull some of your expertise out and apply it to the average person and kind of, you know, today's environment. So, you know, it's January 7th today. We know what happened January 6th in D.C. at the Capitol. Um, taking your security and your situational awareness and your vigilant skills, that kind of disruption can almost happen anywhere these days. And Clint, you just said something that, you know, kind of triggered. You were trying to get space between you and the tornado. Is that the case? I want to hear from both of you. If you find yourself at a concert, at a movie theater, at a, at a mall, at a, at a peaceful rally, and something like that breaks out, what should you do? Yeah, go, Clint. Really? All right, I'll go for it. Sure, sure yeah. go. I'm oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so social unrest, you know, I've been in it multiple times. And so I took some of the experiences I had and created some some easy best practices that anybody could employ. And those are in 100 Daily Skills book two. Um, but first and foremost, you know, you want to avoid it altogether if you can. But like in my world, I, I took a right hand turn in the middle of the Arab Spring and uh, and found myself surrounded by thousands of angry people. And I was in a vehicle. So you have to go. All right. Am I in a vehicle or am I on foot? And you kind of break it down from there. But ultimately, you want to avoid it. If you can't avoid it, then you want to parallel it. Meaning, you know, get to the borders, 
and go with it until you can find an out, right? That could be a cross street, an alley, a building, a doorway, anything to get you out of, of that emotionally charged crowd. Um, you can, you know, going against the grain, I don't recommend it, obviously, um, for certain reasons, but ultimately you're trying to avoid suffocation injuries and crush injuries. So you've got to look out for the barricades, the walls, the fences, and you want to stay away from those as well. Um, ideally, you're keeping your hands up and creating space mm -hmm. so your thoracic cavity actually has room. Um, it can get really congested at times. Um, and so you want to have your hands up, kind of non-threatening, keeping your space between you and all the others. Um, if you happen to fall to the ground, get up as quick as you can. You do not want to be, you know, uh, part of that, you know, under the feet of a stampede. Um, you know, if you can take high ground, like inside of a building or whatever, then you, you should. But ultimately, you want to figure out a way to peel off and exit right or left or whatever you can do and get at least two or three blocks between you and the protest. And probably the single most important thing is looking for and determining those invisible thresholds, right? The thresholds where there's a distance between the people and the barriers or the distance between the people, the protesters and law enforcement, right? Mm -hmm. So because law enforcement isn't going to see you as an innocent person stuck in a crowd. They're going to beat you over the head just like right. everybody else, especially overseas. So mm -hmm. you want to steer clear from all of it. You know, what happened at the Capitol is obviously horrible. Um, and, you know, you saw they just didn't have enough security. Uh, and it, in fact, security was lightened, you know, that day for for some unknown reasons. A lot of my buddies work up there. And so, <laughs> you know, they were like, yeah, I mean. They, uh, you would never have anyone with a backpack get that close to the Capitol building on any other day. So was, there's a lot of, there's a lot of parts and pieces, I think, to what happened yesterday that will come out over time that led to, you know, just why it was so easy for them to just barge on in. But, uh, those are just some quick tips right off the top of my head. Yeah. And, and again, I want to hear from you, Pete, but just to kind of rewind what you said, I, I think naturally people want to turn and, and go away from it. But if what we're hearing is that you need to go with it so that you're going with the crowd because you're going to be, you know, fighting all of these people coming at you. And then that was one of my questions, too. How do you identify yourself as a non-threatening to law enforcement who sees you as one of many? Is keeping your hands up one of those ways in addition to keeping, you know, space around you? But it shows that, like, I am not here to cause right. harm. Okay. Yeah, a, non, a nonviolent posture will always work to your advantage. I mean, what people don't, you know, I mean, most of us may or may not know that 60% of our communication is body language, right? I mean, we talk, but really, whether it's consciously or unconsciously, we look at each other's demeanor and you know if someone's going to be threatening or not, and they don't have to speak a word. So yeah, non-threatening posture, whatever that is, usually it's kind of this typical negotiation style you know, your hands patting the air, you're not in an aggressive stance, you're not saying anything, facial expressions neutral, your behavior, your language, everything is neutral. And hopefully, uh, yeah, if you find yourself pushed face to face with law enforcement, they're going to see that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they know the difference. They're definitely sensitive to body language, like who's threatening and who isn't because they're in it every day. Right, right. Pete, do you have anything to add on to that? Yeah, I suppose um, what I would add, and, and you know, Clint's got all these things down. I, I totally agree. If you're someone, let's use this protest as an example. If you're going to any protest, you've got to decide, you know, Clint and I, like if we were going to go to a combat zone together, we already know sort of like what our plan is in terms of what's too close for someone for me, you know, and then if they get inside a certain spot, I'm going to act decisively. So that deci decisive action can just be like, hey, this is getting too crazy. I'm going to move towards the outskirts of this thing. I'm still going to protest, but I'm not going to get caught up in a stampede. I'm not going to find myself excited and running towards the Capitol building. You know, I'm here to protest. And I know clearly like that is not what part of what I'm doing and remove myself from it. Because if you can act ahead of that group's actions, you know, you're probably going to be able to get out fairly easily. But and Clint's 100 percent right. 
if you like, so I was going to Chico State and we had a, a little bit of a riot going on um, around they had these like they we're going to bring back this holiday season that they had banned because we were a bunch of drunks and we always fought everybody. Not me, but just in, in general in Chico. And so these riots broke out. People were burning couches. They were flipping cars over. And so we went out to go see it. And my roommate got hit over the head with the stick. We'd literally done nothing. But the cops aren't there to sort that out. They don't. They don't. If you're out, you're tra- people that don't want to get hit with the stick act like it. You leave. You get away from that situ- situation. So I would. I would say if you're trying to stay out of trouble in a large group like that, you know, you don't have to leave the group, but be mindful that these things can get out of hand really quick. Decide what you're comfortable with and and get away from that threat when when you can. The other thing I would add to this too is is by engaging. You know, these officers, like Clint talked about a little bit, engaging them in a positive way when you're able to might help you out later on when that crowd goes crazy and that person sees you like that guy's calm, leave him alone. It might help you out when you engage in a positive way ahead of time. So you can you can be ready when something if something happens by doing work ahead of time, knowing where your exit route is, knowing what direction everybody's probably going to go, going a different direction, whatever it is, like thinking those things through in a, in a hostile or potentially hostile situation. So, you know, kind of just sticking with the environment we're in right now, what are some general, give me, each of you give me, you know, two, three tips of what are some general everyday situational practices that you employ? So when you go to that, you guys are highly trained. I am maybe more so than the average person just because I've been in this space, but what should everybody be doing these days to just make sure they are plugged in to what's going on around them and can pre-act as opposed to reacting in some situations? Um, so again, you guys probably do it second nature, so you might have to think about it a little bit. But if you were going to pass along, you know, two or three tips to the, to the average person that maybe needs to bring these back top of mind, what would those be? Um, I, I kick it off again. Sure. Um, yeah, I would say, like, on the awareness side, a lot of it you can do before you walk out the door. You know, I feel like on your projection and demeanor management, you know, you have to look at how you're dressed. What does it say to people? Does it work for the environment you're going into? Because, you know, if you can be the gray person, then you should. And that will eliminate 99% of the issues that you might face out there. You know, if you're one of those that needs to stand out, and, you know, let's face it, our ego dresses some of us in the morning, obviously not me. <laughs> but, uh, if your ego dresses you in the morning and you like to look different than everybody else around you, um, then that may increase, you know, uh, potential threats that are out there. Um, the other piece, you know, besides projection, demeanor, awareness is um your own situational awareness you know knowing the environment you're going to ahead of time people kind of uh i feel like they define situational awareness a little uh not wrong but just different what i would say is you have to know the threats in the environment that you're going into so that you can actually look for those because everyone knows our brains are not computers they can't aggregate the entire environment and then file all that information into folders and determine, oh, that's a threat. That's not a threat. Because if you're trying to pay attention to everything, then you'll inevitably right. pay attention to nothing. Right. And so you have to kind of know, all right, what am I stepping into? And what are the things that could potentially mess with me? So those are more like awareness. And mm-hmm. there's a bunch that goes with all that. But and then you have more physical stuff. Right. You know, we talked about dress, but then it's like that everyday carry that's become popular over the years. Um you know, for us, that was your first line gear, right? You, you got first line, second line, third line stuff. But first line is what you wear and anything that fits in your pockets. So, you know, that's that's everyday carry. And those are the those are like your um, your self rescue items for the most part. You know, if you're in a state where carrying guns is cool, then you should. If you can get away with a five inch blade or less, uh, you know then why not? You know, obviously you need to know how to use these things if you're going to carry them. Um, and that would be, you know, solely for defense. And then you've got, you know, you know, a tourniquet is a great thing. Tourniquets used to be taboo just a couple of decades or a decade and a half ago. It was like a last resort. Now it's a first resort because they've determined in combat that, you know, we can put t- uh, tourniquets on and leave it on for 96 hours straight and it does no damage to the limb. Um, so, you know, and knowing the rules of a tourniquet, you know, go high or die. So you're always going to go as high as possible on the limb. 
crank it down until the bleeding stops and you're good to go. So it's, you know, the first aid aspect has been simplified by allowing tourniquets to become a primary, you know, blood, uh, blood stopper. So, um, you know, and then there's, then there's other, you know, depending on the environment you're going into, dicks can dictate the rest of the items that you carry, but, um, I'll just stop there so that Pete can throw in, you know, his, his thoughts too. Yeah. I want to hear Pete's and then I'm going to come back and I don't want to say challenge you on something, but, but challenge okay. you on something. Sure. <laughs> okay. Pete, what are your situational awareness every day kind of practices? Yeah. I mean, I'll just try to like back up before again, before like what Clint's talking about, I'm going to want to engage with people, you know, wherever I go. So if we're going to DC to the mall, I'm going to try to, again, talk to people, um, find out from that DC park cop that you're going to talk to to, Hey, you know, I see you up there. I appreciate you being up there and keeping us safe. Uh, I'm new around here. What does it look like when stuff starts to get out of hand? Like, when do you start to get worried? Because I want to I want to cue on you because mm -hmm. I'm not trying to be a problem. I'm trying to protest, I'm trying to yell and shout. I'm going to wave my sign around, but I'm not trying to cause anybody any harm. And then just, you know, that that appreciation for them and that connection that you have. And he'll say, you know, like, just keep an eye on me. If you see me on the horse doing this, or if you see these things, that's a time for you to back away and not be part of the problem. You know, and I, I would, again, I would prepare my battlefield in that way. And if you're overseas, it's the same kind of thing. You're trying to engage with locals to find out what's going on. You don't want to make yourself a sucker, but you also like, you know, when you talk to the shopkeeper where you're buying a sandwich or whatever it is, engage in more conversation about who they are, where they're from, what is it like? I mean, and, and, and be complimentary. You know, that's that's the spy in me. Like, I, you don't want to be dis disingenuous, but you want to engage in a way that makes them compelled to talk to you about who they are and what they're about. And everybody loves to talk about where they're from. I, I could get both of you to start doing it by just, you know, feeding you a couple of small lines that are, are very innocuous. Like, oh, right. I'm going to come back to that, but I don't, so I don't want you to go down that path yet. Cause that's actually okay. one of my questions, my specific like tradecraft questions. Oh, okay. 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 Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, yeah I... that, that's yeah. If you're going to go somewhere, you know, I would, I would use engagement of people in a way that makes sense. That's what I would do. Cause everything Clint said is, is, is on the money. I mean, if you should have a tourniquet, you should have an idea of what kind of weapons are available. And if you're not a gun carrying person, I always believe in throwing something at someone who, uh, if you have it, you know, who, who intends to do you harm, you, you right. pick up a garbage can and throw it at them. They're, they're going to have to deal with that. You know, right. you have a book in your hand, you can throw it at them and create space. And I'm not trying to start throwing your book at everybody you see, but you know, just yeah. give them something to worry about if you're uh, in an immediate tactical situation. Okay, so again, I'm just, I want to take this opportunity to turn the tables and you both are very highly trained and you're both male. Females have a different perspective on something. So Clint, if I am not comfortable carrying a knife, which a lot of women aren't comfortable carrying a knife or a gun. And, and Pete, you started to talk about it. These kind of improvised things, you know, let's, let's talk a couple minutes about what can you use if, if you're not comfortable carrying that? I mean, and, and it's kind of, if I'm not mistaken, it's thinking on your feet and being kind of innovative with the pen you have in your hand or the hand sanitizer now that we all have, you know, that can buy some time and create space by squirting it in somebody's eyes. Um, but it can, can you kind of just touch on that? If I'm not comfortable carrying a blade or a gun, which I didn't say I wasn't, but what, what could you substitute with that maybe you're more comfortable yeah i mean the reality is is everything is a weapon so you know when you talk about you know environmental weapons is going into a place and going okay there's a curb there's a hard edge there's aluminum door frames you know things that i can throw a body against and it hurts them and then you have the improvised weapons which is the things you can pick up and use against a bad guy so it's literally anything, but you know, if you know that you're uncomfortable with something, then that's, that is direction to get comfortable with something. Like, you know, I hear it all the time where people spend a lifetime saying, well, I just don't like that. Or I don't want to, what, what do I do if I don't know how to use it? Well, if you've already identified that you don't know how, well then, <laughs> then do it. start doing it. It's like, for me, it's like, it doesn't even make sense, but you know, <laughs> There's knives, there's guns, there's swords. There's a lot of options out there, but you know, you just got to pick something and get comfortable with it is like the first thing I would say. And then 
it makes it opens up the door to a lot of other stuff. You know, when you're traveling, obviously you can't travel with a whole bunch of weapons, but you know, you can get off the plane and a little bit of that trade craft is I'm not going to go directly to my hotel, right? I'm going to stop somewhere and I'm going to do some cover for action and tell a story. I'm going to buy a block of cheese and a knife and an apple and some peanut butter. And I'm going to fill up my grocery bag and go check out. And then maybe I'll make my way to where I'm, wherever lodging is for me, but I'm telling a story, but in that story, I just got everything I need to defend myself. Plus I've got, you know, 72 hours worth of food I can keep in my rental car or whatever. But, you know, it's, there's, there's, you're, there's a, there's a, once you learn just something or get comfortable with it, then, then all of a sudden it opens up the door to all of those improvised possibilities. Is that, a, is that changing a mindset? You know, and this question is to both of you, because most people don't think like that. Like if they're sitting on a, a bus or a train and they're sitting on their phone, which we all have in our hand and they start to feel uncomfortable and they're like, Oh my God, especially women, this is a problem for us. You know, we start to get fearful, but we, because we don't necessarily know what to do. We freeze. But I mean, is it take a mindset to like, Oh, I, I have a, a device here that I can smash somebody's no, it's, is it, my question is, is it changing a mindset so that you give yourself kind of permission to think differently? Yeah, I think that makes sense. I think it's just creativity. And like once you kind of tell people, you'll see the little light bulbs go off and also mm -hmm. they're like, oh, oh, OK. And then they're like, yeah, I could take this. And, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's something right. It's it's better than nothing. It's better than breaking your fist. You know, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're like I said, we're surrounded by stuff. And as soon as you open their eyes up to it, then they're like, oh, got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pete, you have anything? And I'm laughing because I saw one of the the comments slide up, and his name was Brad. Said he uses his yeah. wit. His but, wit, yeah. And Brad's a comedian. I'm questioning, you know, with yeah. your spy background and you know the wit is is def is there a defense mechanism that you can engage somebody and kind of de-escalate it, or you know, I don't know. Just talk to me about what your with yeah, your I spies. Mean, you I wouldn't, it's just like working a gun, right? Everybody knows how to open their mouth and put words down range, but you would have to develop the skill to reliably do it in a situation. And sometimes it's an intuition because I've done it a whole lot. I've talked to a lot of people. Uh, so I, I would say, I don't, I don't, I'm not saying don't talk your way out, but think through what it is. I mean, a lot of this stuff is just pre-thinking what, what the inevitable horrible situation would be. You know, before any patrol, you talk about the most, you know, likely in the most deadly courses of action that you might encounter. And what are we, what are we going to do about that? So if you get to somewhere and I, I love the thing that Quentin's saying about, don't just go straight to your, your place, like go and, you know, go around the neighborhood, check it out, go consume something, make a friend or whatever it is, because just racing to the hotel, it's comfortable, but doesn't necessarily make you safe. And then as a female, I think there's a couple of the small things you can do. Like right here, I have a combat pen. This is a pen you can fly legally with, you know, and it's just a pen. And so you could take something that's less masculine than this and carry it around. But, you know, it's not a plastic snappable off in your hand pen. It's it's a metal pen, you know, and you're like, this is part of my defense. There's nothing wrong with carrying a pen at all. Mm -hmm. Those kind of things. And then if, if there's someone behind you, not to put all women in the same basket, but don't be afraid to take care of yourself. Don't be afraid to stand up for yourself. If someone's making you nervous, you know, yep. respond in a way, you know, don't just be passive. So there's a number of things you can do. Um, I, I taught my daughter this, like if they're right on top of you and they're attacking you, I want you bang your thumb off the back of their eye socket. Don't poke them in the eyes, poke them through the goddamn eye, all mm -hmm. the way to the back of the skull because no one wants to fight like that. And they're going to lose at least one hand holding their eye back together, you know? And I'm not saying jam everybody's eye out, but if you're in a situation where it's you have to defend yourself, defend yourself decisively. You know, you're overpowered by a man and you get one shot. You know, I would try to do that. But before that, you know, if you feel like someone's threatening you, turn and look and see and like see if you can make an instant friend. You know, hey, there's someone I think they're following behind me. Do you mind me just standing next to me here for a second? Could be a man, could be a woman. But now there's two people looking at this person. And so if they have nefarious intent, you just change the odds substantially, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and then you can quickly do that. But you have to decide that it's OK for me to be wrong about this. It's OK if I hurt someone's feelings because okay. I feel threatened. Right. That, and and I, want, I want to pause yeah. you there because that is absolutely, I think, one of the biggest challenges for women is that girls are raised to be nice and more polite. And we are wired to not offend to, you know, not um, 
humiliate, embarrass. So I think that, and I'm speaking for myself and I know it because I've had this conversation with other women. We allow, to your point, Pete, ourselves to stay in an uncomfortable space because we don't, like if we do feel someone walking up on us, we will second think about like, well, I don't want to turn around in case it's nothing, or I don't want to turn around and put somebody on the spot. You said it. We have to get over being uncomfortable, being wrong. And if it's someone who is not a threat, you're like, oh, I'm sorry. I just, I, I didn't mean to, you know, uh, I, I didn't mean to offend you. I just, I felt somebody following me. So I guess, thank you for that permission, because I think we all need to hear it. And especially women, guys don't worry about it as much as we do is like, well, if somebody compliments us, we feel like we have to take it, but it's uncomfortable and cringy sometimes. Do you yeah. have any um, advice or recommendations if we find ourselves in a situation that we don't like some dudes talking to us and we are not enjoying the conversation and we're, we, we don't know how to get out of it sometimes. Do you have any tips as a, a, from the guy's perspective of like, what would shut it down? Like, what should we have in our pocket to deescalate or disengage? Is, is my question making sense? Because this is yeah, a no, real I, thing I for us. Saying. You know, and this goes back to the same thing. Like you have to pre-decide that I'm going to be decisive when I feel uncomfortable and it's okay to take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a bar setting or whatever it is and someone's coming on a little hard, just say, listen, I'm not into it. I appreciate you like me. I'm not here for that. And just decide and then remove yourself from that situation. And if the dude follows you, then you've got a different set of problems. But for the most part, you're just trying to let them know, hey, stop. This mm -hmm. is not for me. Leave me alone, please. You know? Right. But in that moment, not... we're going to be like, we don't want to hurt his feelings, but we have no interest, but we don't want to I mean, to hurt obviously, fuck their feelings, you know? No, I mean, that's, if... what, that's what I would <laughs> yeah. say. But start still, there, and you can natural. always apologize. You can always mm -hmm. do that. You don't have to even do that. You just be decisive, act, and get away from the situation. Yeah. Clint, you have anything? I see you kind of shifting. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, it's okay, you know, to be a dick, right? I mean, we don't have to be nice to everyone. And the reality is, is you're not going to see this person again. So who yeah. cares what they think or, you know, uh, if you're worried about their feelings, they'll get over it, you know, within five minutes. Yeah, yeah. they'll go to the next easy. Right. There you go. go. <laughs> yeah. And I noticed Pete says hard. He said a hard situation. I didn't know what he meant by that, but hard. I kind of keep up hard. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you don't, I totally agree on this not apologizing thing. Like, mm -hmm. you don't have to apologize. You don't owe them an apology. And if you feel like you've really screwed something up, offer to buy them a drink. Yeah, yeah exactly. Hey, let me I mean, buy you a drink. You know, it, my apologies. You would it be shocked, though, how hard that is for some some women to do. Like, they they want to do it, but they just have reservations about about it. So again, we allow ourselves to be uncomfortable, and it it sucks. Um, I, you know, I was somebody, the reason I even got into this is I was somebody who traveled largely on my own at a young age for, you know, a fortune 100 company, 500 company. And, um, I got myself in some pretty cringy situations because I did not recognize signs to stay away from it. So, you know, one quick one is I, I know now you should never accept a ride from the people who troll and fish at the back of a taxi line. I did. Um, it was LaGuardia because the line was like an, an hour long. It's before Uber. I mean, I don't want to age myself, but it was before Uber. And I knew I was going to be in line for an hour. So some guys fishing from the back because that's where they fish because they know you have the longest wait. And I accepted a ride from, you know, one of the, the town car guys. And he grabbed my bag and started walking and I'm following. He's got my bag. But then I start to realize, OK, now we're leaving the terminal. He's got my bag we're getting away from people. Now we're walking towards this parking lot of black town cars. And I, I'm i like, okay, oh shit, I've got myself in this. I wanna get out of it. I had zero idea how. So I just stayed in it and let the hair on my arms raise. Now I'm walking, I'm like, I have no idea where we're going. No one knows I left. I mean, because I was traveling by myself. I don't know who's at the car. So it was just like, I didn't have the confidence or the courage to be like, you know what? I've changed my mind. You guys would be like, give me my damn bag back. I'm going back. I did not have that confidence to do it. Um, so I don't know, you know, if you have anything that you would, I, now I know, don't take lines, don't take rides. You know, I mean, that's the lesson learned, but nobody had really shared that with me. I had to kind of learn it. Um, 
so, you know, that was kind of the motivation for, for getting into the, the work that I do now, which was is training women. And I base it a lot on the things I wish I would have known before I, you know, set out on my professional career. And there are things I want my kids to know, my, my girls to know. Um, but just kind of still going along that line, Pete, your background in getting intelligence out of people how would how would we recognize if someone or can we if someone is striking up a conversation and they're just asking like how do we know if someone's trying to pump us for information and it's for you know bad reasons or if it's just a friendly conversation is there any cues that we should look for does that make sense yeah i think it makes sense and, and i'll do my best to answer it you know, one of the things I always say is like, if you say, hey, where are the bombs to the person you're trying to find bombs from, they usually don't respond to that question because it's <laughs> it's too in your face. Too obvious. So if someone actually asks those kinds of questions, you know, like, where are you going? Where are you staying? You're like, yeah, I'm just not telling you that, you know, that's stuff that you don't have to give away. So you can be friendly. You're like, yeah, I'm here for a conference or whatever it is. Right. Uh, yeah, I'm here. I don't know. A little bit of fun, a little bit of work, you know, just be vague about it. You can be nice and and not answer directly these things. But if if someone's determined to find this out, it's gonna take them some time if they're gonna be crafty about it. So I think you're, the biggest thing you're probably trying to look for is that upfront straight attack. Like I am going to try to find someone who will respond to these questions and that person will self-select into my situation. You know, So that's what you're trying to, I think initially defeat is that self-selection process. Just don't be quite so cooperative. You can be nice, you can be smiling, all those things, but you don't have to answer those where are the bomb questions like mm -hmm. hey where are you staying yeah like yeah out of friends whatever yeah. it is right mm -hmm. so i shared a cringy story of mine I, I, you guys have been in so many more situations than i could ever dream of but you know clint you talked about turning into the crowd of people do you have another cringy story that you know maybe happened when you were in the field and just kind of how, how'd you get out of it and especially uh, yeah. making any connections into what we could apply as a yeah um, you know, social unrest is a big one, but probably outside of that is like, I think what people, it takes a while for like guys in, in my world to realize that, yeah, you're there to do something, but um, you're still open to all those other issues that everyone faces, right? Um, you know, so, you know, one of the instances was something that went on in the media that directly affected di directly affected me you know and there was it was um i would i had been uh working all day and then that night got a call that was like hey get out of there you know I'm like oh what and so get out of there meant wait three hours and her crap lands at some strip and then you get on it and you leave kind of thing right <laughs> so it leaves a lot of uh time um for anything to go wrong but once you know you where i was there was you know i guess a bunch of angry people coming my way and the interesting backstory to that is that day i was being introduced um this is a control issue right so i'm being introduced um by someone i was with in a different language as a danish veterinarian Right. And so and he's telling everybody that. And then midway through, I'm like, what are you telling him? And he's like, Danish veterinarian, everybody loves the Danes. And I'm like, uh, OK. And so he keeps doing that all day long. Right. Well, what happened is that night is when the newspaper came out and published the illustration of Muhammad. And it was a Danish illustrator. So the whole day, remember that he did a half half like human, half dog. Illustration. Yeah, I do remember that. Um, and, Anyway, so the day that that came out, now all of a sudden, here I've been, you know, you, and he was right, right? And everybody loves the Danes and there was nothing wrong all the way up until that day. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the entire, the entire Muslim world hated the Danes. <laughs> so, and I've been introduced all day long as a Danish veterinarian. So, you know, uh, there was, you know, unbeknownst to me, there was definitely chatter that was picked up about coming and killing this you know, Danish veterinarian. And so, you know, before you know it, I'm like having to, you know, juke left, go right and do all kinds of crazy stuff just so that I could get out of there without being massacred. But it was a lesson learned in that, you know, you can't let, you know, letting people 
um, no matter their intentions, letting them kind of guide things in a, in that, in that false, that's like way false, right? In Pete's world, he knows better than I do. It's like, you stay as close to the truth as you can. Um, and that is always your goal, right? Because it's the truth that ends up protecting you if things do go sideways. So, you know, I didn't have control of that and it kind of, you know, and who would have thought, right? That was just the odds were against me on that. Well, particular why, thing. <laughs> did I miss, why were you being introduced as a Danish veterinarian? Did I miss that of the story? Yeah, there's, that's a much longer probably. Oh, yeah. all right. Yeah. Okay. Long story. <laughs> You'd have to kill me if you told me. No, it's just, <laughs> it would just add a considerable amount of time to the discussion. <laughs> Pete, Pete, you got any cringy stories that we can learn from of like, you know? Yeah, when... yeah. I mean, again, from my side of the world, right? You know, and and I've worked with guys like Clint before. I go out, we approach these problems differently, which is what makes a team powerful when we go out and, and do these things. But before I learned really how to do this early in my spy days, uh, we had to go to a, a bar in uh, Bosnia. And it was it was a mission where you got to understand, first off, our teams are super small teams. It's four people. Right. And half of us have pistols. One of us, me in this case, is working, not like focused on my weapons. I'm, my job is to focus on my conversation that I'm having. So to, to plan this operation, we really can't defend ourselves, you know, reliably. And we're going to this bar full of ne'er-do-wells, bikers or whatever you want to call it. Right. Like a really dangerous place. And we've never been there before. So we don't know enough to know anything about it, but we have to go do this job. And the, and the unit was trying to decide, the larger unit was trying to decide if it was worth sending us into this situation because it was full of bad people. Um, and so my basic plan was basically just do a dead man switch and just have a grenade in my hand. And if things went sideways, hold it up and walk out, you know, which is terrifying. And it was, uh, it was an option. The more, uh, and we did that. But then I realized we were safer with the pin and the grenade and no dead man switch and we'd be all right because I got there and I got comfortable with what was going on. But with the unknown, it was it was terrifying. So what I realized with with that mission and a bunch of other ones is that for the most part on a CI team, a counterintelligence spy team, you really can't fight your way out of a situation. It's nice to have something to point back, but we have to protect ourselves with culture and charm more than anything else. That's our lead weapon. And since most of us are more like that and we're not a, a SEAL team, you know, you need to understand that there are a lot of charm based, cultural based weapons that you have at your disposal that you can use to get yourself out of a situation. So, you know, give, give that, two examples of that when you're saying you have these tools, these culture and charm tools, like yeah. apply it to something, well, to, uh, apply yeah. it to something that that the average person, not necessarily your. One thing I want to say too, before we get to further, a lot of this stuff is gray zone, right? Like you're not sure A or B or F, whatever option it's going to be. And you have to be comfortable that a lot of things don't have an obvious answer. And that's why simply getting away from it is probably the best answer to give yourself time. So examples of, of how to do this is, it's again, simply ask a person where they're from and you can know something about that region and ask the question in a wrong way. So I can say, hey, you're from Indiana. You guys are, you know, you guys hate basketball and you'd be like, no, idiot. We love basketball. And now you're talking. You can't help it. You have to talk about basketball. Even if you're not a person who loves basketball in Indiana, you that is part of who you guys are. So now I've got you in the conversation with you talking to me a whole bunch. And, and now I have not more control, but I, I have you thinking less about what you're saying and you're more responding from the heart. These are the kind of things you're looking for. If you compliment someone on their hospitality. And you say, gosh, people in Indiana are the most hospitable people I think I've ever met. This is really God's country. There's no person in Indiana that's going to be like, no, you're wrong. It's horrible. Maybe they'll say they're <laughs> wrong. Maybe they hate it there. But for the most part, they're going to agree that their hospitality is good and that Indiana is a good place. And so you're working from a positive perspective and you're allowing them to be them. You can protect yourself with that person. Now you've, you've made them a little bit more your friend. You've established a little bit of rapport, you know. And then and another thing is, is think about when people talk about rapport and trust, they, they don't really have a systemized way of approaching it. So when you talk about trust, like you extended trust to that guy with the uh, town car service, you know, and then you realize that it was probably too high of a risk of trust and you wanted to retract it. You're trying to balance these things out. Someone says they're going to show up at two o'clock. Hey, they're there at two o'clock. OK, great. That's a little coin. It's a little bit of trust that you guys have exchanged. You can ratchet it up from there and exceed, you know, 
where it goes. But it's it's a real a feeling thing, I think, as you do it, but you want to test that trust mm -hmm. as those feelings start to go left and right, not where you think they're going to go. Don't be afraid to abort and say, I don't trust this mm -hmm. because I don't know this person. I don't know them that well. Or say, you know, this is a bet, but I'm going to go ahead and go with this person. I, I had to bet all the time to survive. You know, mm -hmm. I've been in I've been in the cars of foreign national people with nothing but maybe a radio in my hand because that's where I had to go to develop the trust and to get to the information that no one else can get to because you can't go with the platoon of people. Right. So mm -hmm. having a calculated risk is what guys like Clint and I did all the time. There's always calculated risk. Mm hmm. Clint, do you have any thoughts on like any of your, your again, I call it tradecraft. I don't know if that's the right word, but just something that you could apply to the average person. And yeah. I'm going to say female. I'm going to say female just because. I think what Pete's saying, like rapport is like a weapon in itself. So building good rapport. Um, I tell people all the time, the business card you collect from someone in wherever you are, well, those people will help you long before the State Department will. So if you're building good rapport and you're collecting that information and you've got it, um, like if something did go sideways and you end up in jail, those people are going to help you way faster uh, and be able to do more than, you know, the almighty State Department, which... Mm -hmm. I personally would have zero trust in, <laughs> so not not to get me out anytime soon. So that's I think, you know, from what Pete's saying, that's what I always drew from it was, hey, you want to make friends uh, anytime you can, because that friend may end up being your best ally when things go a little uh, sideways for you. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of you touched upon it earlier, but the whole idea and importance of blending in. And, and blending in, you know, domestically is one thing, but can can both of you talk about just kind of why, put some context around why it's important to blend in and, and you know, maybe leaving the bling at home when you're going ab abroad. Um, and, and, you know, I've heard that like backpacks and company logos and U.S. sports teams make you a target. So can you just kind of expound upon uh, and, and, and I actually have a very personal reason for asking this. My daughter is an international and global studies major. She's going to have to go. She, it's re, she's required to study abroad. I am pretty sure that she and even her her generation just no one has ever told them the importance of of going over and blending in and our borders are, are you know, the, the world is a much smaller place now. So you might not want to wear what you would typically wear, you know, going to the mall here when you're going overseas and just putting some context around why that is. Um, yeah, I, I definitely talked about projection and demeanor management and, and that is blending in and it's more than just what you're wearing it's how you present yourself it's the word you use you know you got a lot of former military they'll sit in the lobby of a hotel overseas and you can peg them because they'll be like where's the head oh let's meet down the lobby at 1800 and you know they're using all this jargon um and right off the bat you know exactly who they are and their background uh within seconds so you know Think of, you know, how you blend in. It's it's not just leave the jewelry home and, you know, make sure you wear neutral co colored clothing and, um, you know, stay away from all. Yeah, obviously the big logos and all that, you know, we call them bullseyes and, mm -hmm. um, you know, anything that represents America. Sometimes it's a good idea just to, to you want to look, you want to try and make people go, wait a minute. They, they, you, you want them to question exactly who you could be right there's plenty i've been in the deepest darkest areas of africa and there are white people there and when i look at them i know that they're not american and why is that well it's because how they present themselves from afar how they're dressed and you know so if if you are like me you know there's this white guy going into these areas then you have to really figure out how do i make people question whether i'm american or not from afar and so it all has to do with a little bit of, you know, you got to do your research on the culture. You've got to know what you're about to step into and then build your how you dress to those dynamics. You want to wear what they're close to what they're wearing. That makes sense. 
right? I'm not going to put on a robe and a gutra when I'm hanging out in Saudi because people are going to go, okay, why is this dude wearing, a, you know, a man dress <laughs> and his gutra and, you know, just, but, you know, I know the limitations of what I could get away with so that when people look at me, they go, oh, maybe he's from France. Maybe he's from South Africa. You know, there's, you know, you, you want to just confuse it to a certain mm -hmm. degree, but ideally the ultimate goal and I tell people all the time, when you're sitting at the international terminal at an airport and you're what we all people watch, the people that you pay attention to are the ones that you don't want to be like. You want to be that person in the background that just skirts by and you didn't even see them, right? Mm -hmm. I used to have to tell team guys, you know, SEALs like going through different training, like, you know, I hate to say it, but it's like you have to like take that alpha male and like, you know, pussify him to a certain degree. You got to say, take off the Solomons, put on the penny loafers, take off that Sunto watch and put on a Casio little, you know, you know, you want to be boring. You want to be unattractive. Uh, your clothes don't need to fit all tight. If you got some intimidating tattoos and you probably want to cover them up. I mean, it's, so, some of this is just common sense. But, yeah, you're right. There's not too much common sense these days. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'll stop there. Yeah, Pete, you got any got anything to add? Yeah, yeah, sure. And I agree. I agree with everything Quint's saying. I love gray manning things. I love just being invisible. Uh, it's one of my favorite things when I'm in Germany and someone says, you know, ask me in German for directions. You know, I mean, I, that means I'm doing my job. Uh, let's just say you're bound to determine to to wear something more blingy and more American. And again, that's fine. Uh, you're just trying to recognize a situation that could get out of hand ahead of time. I'll give you a little story. So we were we were in uh, Egypt just after 9-11. This is in uh, October. And we were going out to all the antiquity sites. This is as a military group, and we're all wearing civilian clothes. But they're all civilian clothes that we probably bought at the PX in Egypt. You know, So it it's still kind of like military clothes. So we were there, and you had to dress modestly. And there was a, a young, attractive female who had a sweater set on that just this does not sound super sexy she had, you know big boobs and all that but the army's like hey you have to cover that up she's like what cover what up I'm, I'm completely covered up i have a sweater set on you know and they're like well it's too sexy and so she went and bought a sweatshirt or whatever right to kind of desexify it we get to the pyramids and there's probably a polish girl some kind of check some kind of you know eastern european type chick tube top tiny shorts no bra bouncing all over the, uh, you know, the area. And so just don't get too crazy about this. You can blend in in a way that, you know, is you, but you're trying not to stand out. Don't catch someone's eye, you know? So like if you've got the super blingy phone case, maybe don't bring that. Maybe get a travel case that's more modest because there are people that are praying for praying on tourists. They absolutely are. And they're going to try a bunch of different ways. It is the major, like you go to Mexico, it's the major leagues of getting kidnapped, of being mm -hmm. uh, having your money stolen from, you know, by taking you to an ATM or whatever. They are a pro at this. You are fish. And so you right. want to try to avoid being that. So if you insist on wearing those kind of clothes, take appropriate measures to make sure that you're not alone and in well-lit spaces. I mean, you can do it. You just have to account for it. Is there anything in particular, again, I'm, I'm trying to get the female perspective here, that you would say different applying it specifically to a female situation and maybe not but is there anything anything else you want to staple on to what you've said that would be specific to yeah. women i mean i think specifically and this is uncomfortable for women in this country to hear but in most countries in the world you need a squire you need someone with you because if you're alone you will stand out it doesn't matter what kind of clothes you wear you're a woman out and about and it doesn't mean you have to wear a hijab or anything else. You don't have to mm -hmm. ape someone else's culture to do it. You should have a man around because but it's going to. that's a culture thing, right? And that's kind yeah, of what I say. Know yeah. the culture you're going. You don't have to go in there and be, you know, like I refuse to because you're, that's actually just can be ignorant. I mean, it's, it's, you're very savvy by understanding what you're going into. And it's not that you're, you know, letting go of any of your, your womanhood or strength. It's just being smart. It's, it's the smarter thing. So. Yeah, I mean, there's a thing called CQ, cultural intelligence, basically, right? Mm -hmm. And you're yes. using culture against your advantage that way. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're from a culture where women are empowered and we all love that. Mm -hmm. Now you are in a different place where right. women, in, I mean, how many countries in the world can a man walk up to a woman and strike her because she didn't comply with some kind of, you know, 
edict from the Quran or whatever. I mean, there's a lot of places mm -hmm. like that. And mm -hmm. so if you think that you can walk around with a chip on your shoulder, mm -hmm. you're mistaken because right. you will you you stand the risk of being corrected and potentially lethally so in some places. Right. So and I'm not trying to scare people, but it's OK to work within their norm to keep yourself safe. That's that cult cultural protection thing right. I was talking about earlier. If, right. if this is what they do, do it. And yeah, you don't have yeah. to wear a hijab. You can keep your hair out. They, they know you're not Islamic, but you have to have someone around to kind of vouch for you. Well, and that's it's, just it's respectful too, right? I mean, you're showing respect for the culture. Maybe. I mean, it just depends on that, what that culture is, right? And so you don't get to determine what's respectful. They do. And right. so ask them to determine. We shouldn't be afraid of culture. We should learn how to work within it and have acuity so that whatever cultural mm -hmm. situation you end up in, that you're in the right position to be able to let that culture protect you. Bringing your culture exclusively is not going to. So I would say, you know, head coverings, whatever. You, if, if if folks there are like, you have to cover up more, then cover up more. Mm -hmm. But if they don't, I don't know how many times I've had Islamic men say, yeah, we don't care what you do at Ramadan. You're a Christian. Now, whether I'm a Christian or not, they not matter them. They just know I'm not them. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, you can drink your water. Yeah, you can have a sandwich. It's my it's my job to suffer through Ramadan, not yours. You mm -hmm. know, so use culture to your advantage. Don't don't use your ego to your disadvantage. Right, right. Clint, you have any other thoughts on that? No, I think that's good. I mean, I you know, I've in other you know, some of the other books, I've broken it down where those are the four pieces of awareness. You have situational, you have your personal, which we've covered. That's how you dress your demeanor. You have cultural awareness, which we've hit on. You know, you got to know all these things. And then, of course, third party awareness is the one that you can't control unless you pay attention to the first three. And so as long as you're paying attention to your personal awareness, situational and cultural, then that third party piece, that's where you become gray. Mm -hmm. All right. I know we're coming up on an hour and I want to be respectful of your time. But my last question to both of you, if you're going to give two pieces of advice, three pieces of advice to your wife, your daughter, your sister, your mother, what would it be in general for women? What are the two, three things we should really get comfortable doing and should practice, make it a habit, just your, your, your parting wisdom? For women for women i'll go first and i'll keep it simple based on the, you know some of the stuff i just got finished you know, diving into and that's on the combative side um you know if you have someone if you're if it's a confrontational moment face to face zone awareness right this is a drill that mom and daughters can do right now and that is stand you know 10 15 feet apart and one just slowly walks towards the other. And you'll know that moment when it's like, okay, that's, that's the limit. That's the danger zone. So know what that is. Know what that feeling is. Once somebody gets that, and all the way up to nose to nose, and then step back and do it again. And so in, in the world of combatives, that's your zone awareness, right? And know that inside the zone, there is the second, the second thing, a second piece of advice, just so you have something you can do to get better, is the reactionary gap. Okay, the reactionary gap is just like that game we all used to play. You put your hands out and, you know, you put palm to palm and then you try to slap the palm, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to do the same thing, but the difference is, is if I'm standing face to face with you and I tell you, hey, I'm just going to reach out and I'm going to thump you in the chest and I want you to block it. I'm going to hit you in the chest every single time. So understand the reactionary gap, meaning if you're inside striking zones, then you need to be the first one to strike if you want to win, right? Because I can tell you, you can tell me that you're going to hit me in the chest and I'm still not going to block it. You know, that's how the reactionary gap works. So if you're inside my danger zone, then I know, okay, I'm going to have to take action first, because if I let them, then I'm going to, I'm going to lose this game, right? Unless they get lucky and they miss or something, but why take that chance? And then when you're outside that gap, then you know, that's right. You can, and obviously through all of this, you deescalate through posture and communication, and you're always looking to exit left, right, get off the X as soon as possible. But I feel like these days, it's, you, you, yes, you're always looking for the exit. You always want to de-escalate and stop whatever potential violence is about to happen. 
but it doesn't stop there, right? There is, you have to have that zone awareness and you need to understand the reactionary gap so that you can live another day. And uh, it's something that, you know, like I said, everyone can practice right now at home and know what that feels like and then leverage it anytime you're out and about or you find yourself in that bar situation you were talking about, right? Mm -hmm. That's, most of these guys are getting inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if they make the first move, then you're going to probably have a hard time coming out on top. Yep. And I, and I just want you to state it again. It is okay to offend or not worry about hurting feelings. I mean, that is always that that pause that we have. Like, oh, I don't want to hurt his feelings. Yeah, I think it's a, hear right. It's a, it's a thoughtful step-by-step -step process. You're not going to come out of the gates verbally swinging, right? You want to at least try to be polite and de-escalate or let them know, hey, I'm not comfortable with what's going on. No offense. I just had a bad day. Or, mm -hmm. hey, let me buy you a drink. Hey, bartender, blah, 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 blah. And then exit left, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's a lot of ways to get yourself out of it. And those are the things you should do first before you go, hey, fuck face, you know, <laughs> you know, I don't, I, I don't, I'm not comfortable with you being here. So get out of, get out of my way or, you know, whatever mm -hmm. it is. Um, it, yeah. Anyway, mm -hmm. kill them Thank with you. kindness first before you kill them with your fist. <laughs> okay. Pete. Yeah, I mean, obviously, everything Clint's saying is, is on the money. So I'll just try to take uh, some, some different angles and different perspectives. Uh, and he's 100% right. Like, you need to decide when they're, when too close is too close. And that's not just physical. That can be mental, you know, or dom dominating in some other way or whatever. Uh, as a female, you can always – look if you've been targeted for something and you're worried about that, you don't have to be right or wrong. Just like if you feel that, that's great. Change the odds. Find someone else to be a friend. Now, I know that girls like to travel in packs, so we'll just leave the obvious thing alone. Like, yeah, of course, have someone with you. But if you don't have someone with you or your someone is somewhere else, turn to that person next to you and make a friend and say, hey, I could use your help. I need a favor. If someone turned to Clint right now and said, hey, I, I'd use a favor. Can you just stand here for a second and talk to me? Yeah. He's always going to say yes. That person's always, and if not, the person next to them. And the next thing you know, like you're looking for help and someone's going to give it to you. But the other thing I would say is just... It's easy to say, but try to be aware of your surroundings and practice this when you're not in a dangerous situation so that you can start to become more comfortable in these situations. You're not supposed to be good at this right away. So like when you go to the grocery store, do you know other ways to get out besides the two front doors? You know, do you have you ever looked and just poked your head back there? No one's going to get mad if you are like, oh, there is an exit and it's straight back that way. Or do I have to go through the break room? You know, know these things, practice mm -hmm. understanding it and kind of intuiting eventually where the uh, routes are that are alternate, because if everybody's running out the front door and you're running out the back, you're going to be one of the few people doing that. You're going to get the heck out of there. And again, don't wait. Act decisively. When the fire alarm goes off at work, and even if it's a fire drill, try to be the first person to safely get out of the building. You know, like recognize that danger and act because freeze is an absolute mm -hmm. natural response. Flight, everybody says fight and flight, but freeze is one of them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes freeze can be used to find the best way out, take that moment to, to act, but then act decisively. So Find a friend, act decisively, know your routes to get away from the threat. And I think you'll be in a much better position. Oh, and it's okay for things to feel uncomfortable as you try to learn how to do these things. It's not, culture's not comfortable all the time as you try to learn how to navigate through it. Dangerous situations aren't comfortable uh, until you've been, you know, practicing how to deal with those things. And all of a sudden you'll find out that that, that discomfort that you don't like is really miscomfort. And you learn how to remanage it and go, this isn't that dangerous. I know how to manage, manage and mitigate this risk. Great. Thanks. Well, we're, we're up on an hour. Um, thank you both so much. This was insightful. Clint, if anyone wants to find you, where do, where do they go? And tell us about your next project that you have coming up. Yeah, clintemerson.com. I try to keep that up to date, um, but there's a lot of, if you just Google any of that, you'll find um, you'll find a plenty of information, almost too much. But uh, <laughs> the, uh, the next book, the 100 Deadly Skills Combat Edition, is coming out here at the end of the month. Um, that one is turned out to be pretty cool because it's the first comprehensive combatives book from hand-to-hand, -hand, knife, pistol, rifle, uh, and beyond. And it has like almost 100 videos embedded into the illustrations um, so that you learn directly from the experts that I kind of went out and put in it. So just look for that. I think that's the probably the coolest thing. Um, in a long time so that people can better protect themselves. Great.
Pete, any any plug? I know if they're if they're watching this now, they're <laughs> hopefully already subscribed. Um, yeah, I'm subscribe to the Break It Down Show. Uh, if you're on, wherever you're watching it, subscribe or hit me up, at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. I'm glad to talk to you and fill in the blanks wherever you need them. BreakItDownShow.com or Pete A. Turner on all social media, and I, I'm I'm pretty accessible with that. And then also, shall we plug your stuff because what you're doing is important as well. Yeah. So I, again, I, I do some training and some speaking and I, I primarily focus on female audiences just because that's where I can connect and that's where I have stories to share that, that are relatable. Um, but you can connect with me on Facebook um, or you can visit stilettoagency.com and I would love to talk to you. And um, again, I, I sincerely thank you for this opportunity. I hope that the listeners walked away with something and um, anytime you need a sub, let me know. All right. You got it. All right. I'm going to press stop on this thing.